Good morning. I just, uh, I just want to build on what Pastor Kerry was saying, that small groups here are not for entertainment, but they are absolutely a necessity. So I really encourage you to do that uh, as the body of Christ. But 10.30, are we alive? Are we awake this morning? No weather, no cold. It's going to stop the energy in this service. I like it. Good. Well, I, I, I'm Pastor Luke, and uh, I'm the high school pastor here. And I was just thinking the other day, how crazy is it that I have survived Iowa for four years? Thank you for your prayers. We're making it so far. Uh, but I'm super honored that I get to share with you this morning. I will point out, and she probably doesn't want me to do so, but my wonderful mother is here this morning, right over here. She's uh, second to my wife, the most amazing woman on the planet, Brownie Points. So thanks for that. But uh, if, uh, if she's really shaped who I am today, so if you have a problem of, with who I am, it's her fault, not mine. So. <laughs> Uh, but I just want to share this morning uh, from the book of Joshua, and if you haven't read that book in a while or have never read it, I really encourage you because it's, it's got some powerful stories and examples of leadership, everything from failure to, to triumph, and, and uh, it's really powerful. But how many by the raise of hands would, would say this morning, I have, I've heard of the sun stand still prayer that he prayed. I've heard of that. Raise your hand. Good. Um, it's a really popular prayer. We know it. It's kind of known, and in my opinion, it's, it could be the most faith-filled prayer that we see in the Bible. A man would stand there and look up at the sun and say, God, you keep that thing in the sky, and I know you can do it. That's, that's full of faith, but I truly believe to understand that prayer in its entirety and what God wants to teach us this morning, the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we're just going to look at the context of what's going around, so uh, around uh, what jo- with Joshua. And so uh, why don't you just join me as we pray this morning to kick off. God, we just thank you that we can be in your presence this morning. Jesus, I thank you that you have something in store for us. We open our hearts and our minds. Uh, and I, I thank you, God, that you want to encourage and challenge us and, and, and change perspective this morning. Uh, we thank you for what you're going to do. And we thank you for the victory that we have in your son, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 So um, some, this, this prayer happens in Joshua chapter 10, but if you look back a couple chapters, in chapter 8, uh, we see that Joshua had just come over the victory of Jericho, you know, marching around these walls of this impenetrable city that couldn't be defeated, and God brings it down, and then they defeat another in uh, just massive nation uh, of I, or AI, I can't really pronounce that. Uh, so apologize for that. But uh, so Joshua's a little puffed up here. He's coming off some serious victories uh, concerning taking the promised land uh, and the, the place that God has called them to be. Um, and this, this people group, the Gibeonites, shows up on the scene and they recognize there's no way they're going to come against God. And so instead of fighting, they come with deception. And uh, it was a law that God said, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to make a covenant, make peace with anyone in the promised land because I've called you to conquer all of them. So you're not going to make peace with them. We're going to get them all out of here. And so they, Joshua and the Israelites knew they weren't going to make peace with anyone around them. They were going to, they were called to conquer. And, uh, so the Gibeonites, they dressed up in ragtag and got like moldy bread and they made it look like they made this incredible journey, this long journey from far away and uh, met with Joshua and the leaders of Israel and to deceive them to say, hey, we're not from around here, but we're, we're just being cautious. Let's make peace. So we'll be your slaves. Don't worry about it. And in that verse, it specifically says, and I quote, uh, they did not consult the Lord. They didn't consult the Lord. And uh, I truly believe that this isn't, uh, that's not a place uh, from from weakness that Joshua made that decision, but I think it was from the victory that he made that decision. He got a little puffed up. We know that pride comes before the fall. And so he did not consult the Lord. They didn't, as a nation, go to the Lord for direction in this. And they said, yeah, you uh, you can be our slaves. We'll make peace. We won't conquer you. That's fine. You're away. Well, he comes, comes to find out he's tricked. And uh, we pick up in Joshua chapter 10, uh, 
verse 5. Uh, you can join with me on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Uh, so these five Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack. They all moved their troops into a place and attacked Gibeon, uh, this people group that they, he just uh, made a treaty with. The men of Gibeon quickly sent messengers to Joshua and Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants, they pleaded. Come at once, save us, help us. For these kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. So we see that these five nations had heard about Joshua and they're like, "Uh uh-uh, we're not gonna be conquered, so we're gonna join together forces and we're gonna attack these these slaves of Joshua. So Joshua, starting in verse seven, Joshua and his entire army, including his best warriors, left Gilgal and set out for Gibeon. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua, for I have given you victory over them. Listen to this, not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. So Joshua traveled all night from Gilgal and took the Amorite kings, or the Amorite armies by surprise. God lays out a strict promise. You're gonna have victory and a in-depth detailed promise. Not one of them will overtake you. Um, We need to understand that a battle, a struggle, a storm, a fight, whatever you wanna call it uh, in your life, that there is three sources, if you will, that this struggle can come from. Three sources that I wanna go through and this is gonna help us immensely determine how we fight. The first battle can come or the source can, of a struggle can come, one, from God. From God. And, and the key here is, is how you, how I'm going to talk about this is God does not cause, but he allows. And there's a big difference between the two. So if, if I were to say my future son, and sorry mom, this is not a pregnancy announcement, so don't, uh, we're good. Uh, my future son wants to learn how to ride a bike, take his training wheels off. I'm going to allow him to go off the training wheels and he may fall. I'm gonna allow him to do that, but in no place am I going to run up to him and push him down and cause him to fall. Does that make sense? So me as a good father, I will allow him to fall. Why? Because I want him to grow. I want him to learn how to ride a bike. Now is any time that I can, I'm going to to catch him. But if he's going away fast, I can't get there, boom, he falls, that's gonna grow him. But me, as a good father, I'm never gonna run and push him down. That would just be mean, that'd be horrible. And so God allows things to happen in our lives to help us, to grow us. The second cause or source of a struggle in our life is, is from Satan. He, it says he comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan entered the scene with Adam and Eve and he caused them to sin. And, and thus sin broke into the world and it, it messed it all up. It's broken systems, broken people, broken nations, and, and, and struggles and fights and, and, and trauma and stress and all these things can come from the brokenness that Satan has caused. And so a lot of things in our life that we're struggling with are coming from Satan. He's, he's an enemy of us, he's an enemy of God, we know that. And the third cause, and this one's a hard one to chew on is me. I can cause the source. I am the source of a struggle in my life. It can be from sin. We know that sin separates us from God, but why does God hate sin? Because sin hurts people. It hurts me. If I sin, it hurts me. It hurts you. It hurts people around me. Sin hurts. And so I can, through sin or through just a bad choice, everything I do has a reaction to it. So I can make a bad choice financially and I'm going to deal with the consequences. I can make a bad choice relationally and I'm going to deal with the consequences. And so we need to understand this morning that it can be from me. I can be the source of the struggle that I'm going through. And why, why do I want you to understand these three sources? Is because if you understand what source your struggle is from, that will help you effectively fight that battle. What do I mean by that? If I sin in a certain way and it's hurt people around me and it's hurting myself, my best fight in that struggle is nothing but repentance. 
God, I messed up, I need you. I'm gonna turn like repentance really means. I'm gonna turn 180 degrees and I'm gonna go the opposite way. I'm gonna trust in you for strength to do it. That's how I fight that battle. Now if I sinned in a way and I hurt people, but I was playing the victim and they, he said, she said, they did that, and I think, oh, well, Satan's using people to bring me down. I'm not gonna fight and respond in the right way if I don't identify. I'm gonna blame Satan, he's so bad, poor me, he's out to get me, when in turn, it is my place to repent first. If God is allowing something to happen in my life, my, my proper and most powerful response is, God, I don't see the whole picture, but give me the strength to trust in you because you have a plan and a purpose. That's my best fight against that struggle. But I have to understand where the source is coming from. And Joshua gives us a great example of how to respond and fight in a battle, especially one that came from his own hand. We see he caused this. If he would have just consulted the Lord, this fight wouldn't even probably be here in this context. He, he caused it, now he's pulling the whole nation of Israel, he pulled the, the whole Gibeonite uh, people group, and, and, and now this big mess happens, and he's gotta do something about it. And he gives us a great example about his response. What he did not do is he did not sit on the ground and whine and cry and blame God and blame other people. Well, if those Amorite kings wouldn't be against me, man, this wouldn't be happening. He didn't blame the other Israelite leaders for why didn't they give me good advice. He didn't do any of that. He did not play the victim role in this. But we see he, 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 what he did is in fact the opposite. We don't see evidence of complaining. We don't see evidence of blame anywhere else. But he says, all right, here we go. He gets his best troops and he travels overnight to fight. He doesn't drag his feet. He doesn't do anything but give his all because he recognizes. And on the way there, he's reminded that he needs God's strength alone to have victory. That was the proper response to a problem that he caused. And, that, and, and our responses to, to things that happen in our life will determine if you are a victim or a victor. Your response. Yes, in life, like I said, there is, there is broken systems. We live in a broken world and sometimes things happen that we cannot control and we're struggling and we're in a battle and we're in a fight in a storm and I, I don't know how I got here. I, it wasn't even by my hand. But how I respond to that, I can control. I can always control my response to a situation around me. Even though I may not be able to control the situation, I can control my response. And see, the victim mentality of poor me, why am I here, why, uh, blaming other people and, 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 or causing, putting blame on other people for my actions and what I'm doing. Uh, what that does, that victim mentality, it keeps you in that fight longer because the victor mentality moves you through the fight because you know I am a victor God has called me victorious. Just like Joshua, he's saying, God told me not one of them will overcome me. I'm gonna give you victory. So he's going, I'm a victor. That's not something I do, that's who I am. I walk in victory, and so nobody coming up against me can come up to God. And so my response is, I'm gonna trust in God, but I'm gonna give my all. I'm not gonna drag my, uh, you, you see what I'm saying? There's such a difference, but if he, if he played the victim there, I wonder how the story would have looked and how differently he would have responded if he was playing the victim. Oh, poor me. We're not gonna go fight him, they're too great. Or this or that, and, and they wouldn't have had victory, even though God has already given it to them. And sometimes in our life, there's struggles and storms and surroundings that we are playing the victim that God has called us to be the victor. And he's called us for a complete and whole victory. And the, the, the focus here is instead of focusing on what you're going through, you focus on what you're going to. I'm, go, I'm walking to victory because God's called it. If he's with me, who can be against me? Not Satan, not even my own devices, not this broken world. And so I'm not focusing on what I'm in, but I'm focusing on what I'm going to and walking to victory. You are a victor. 
and you can choose that this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Romans chapter 8, 31, uh, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life, is, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger of the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered sh as sheep to be slaughtered. No! I love this. In all these things, we are more than what? Conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that death nor life, angels, demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. You are more than a conqueror this morning. In every situation, you are more than a conqueror. And in, in order to be called and have the identity of a conqueror, you have to win something. You have to conquer. And we just read that who won the victory for us? Jesus did on the cross. That we didn't have to pull ourselves up out of something, but he first went to the cross and said, I'll give you the victory. I fight for you. I'm with you. And we can have that this morning. First John 5 says, For everyone born of God overcomes this world. It is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? The only one who believes that Jesus, only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You are an overcomer. Struggle, storm, fight, battle, you are an overcomer. And that is not my words, that is the truth that can set you free from the victim mentality this morning. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. You are not a victim here, you are a victor. Joshua caused this fight, but God was faithful. God was faithful through it, and he's patient with us. Joshua, like I said, he traveled all night. He got whatever he could control in order and he fought hard and trusted God for the rest. Verse nine in Joshua 10 says, uh, or verse 10, excuse me, the Lord threw them into a panic and the Israelites slaughtered great numbers of them at Gibeon. And then the Israelites chased the enemy along the road to Beth Horon, killing them all the way along to Azekah and Makeda. As the Amorites retreated down from the road from Beth Haran, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Azekah. The hail, I love this, the hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites did with the sword. Jesus is fighting for you, and he could do more and have more victory in and through you than you could ever do, than you could ever have. Verse 12, on the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. I love this prayer because Joshua, think about this. So the Lord, he, he brings his army, he fights hard. The Lord starts throwing people in the panic and brings a hailstorm as they're retreating to kill more than Joshua could even touch. And so he sees the Lord's fighting for him and he sees victory on the horizon. He's already winning, the, the enemy is running away. He already has victory. But my argument this morning is I, I don't think partial victory is victory at all. 
that he was saying, God, you've called me, not one of them shall leave, not one of them shall overcome me. You've called me to absolute complete victory in this situation, so I'm not gonna let one away. And we know that God has called us to complete victory. And Joshua could have settled. Well, at least I dodged a bullet there. I didn't get hurt because that was my fault. I messed up, but wow, we can move on from that. I mean, they're running away, we're good now. And we do this with sin, we do this with things in our lives that we make a peace treaty with something around us that God has called us to conquer. And later in life, it comes back to haunt us. And what area, may I challenge you this morning, what area in your life have you settled for partial victory that God has called you to complete victory? What area? What circumstance that God is saying, I give you each one, I give you everything. Don't make peace with, any, with don't take that out of context. Don't make peace with anyone because you're gonna conquer everyone. That's bad for the neighborhood. But <laughs> in, in, a, in a, a sense of fears and sin, don't make peace with any of that. You're not meant to live alongside that. You're meant to conquer it. And, and, and God is in control of that. Complete victory. Let the sun stand still over Gibeon, a prayer full of faith and outrageous and courageous faith. But if you break down this prayer contextually, look what's going on. It's a man that didn't trust in God and trusted in himself, didn't consult the Lord, caused a mess, and now he's in a fight with a bunch of people groups that just craziness. And if you look at this prayer, the sun doesn't move, the earth does. So in a sense, yes, and they didn't know that, I get that, but I wanna make a point here, that the prayer was even a broken prayer. And God answered it because it was for his purpose. So how much more if you in your life and me in my life, it doesn't matter if my prayer is broken. It doesn't matter if I'm in a situation that I even caused, that I know the Lord will fight for me and I can pray that for his purpose to give me complete victory and he's gonna answer that. He's gonna answer that. And uh, we can't mistake this morning that this prayer is just a cop out just to get out of jail free car, God, make this happen so I can get away. Or the statement that I've heard too often, and I've even said in my own life, well, all we can do now is pray. That's a cop-out prayer in my opinion, because sometimes in my life, I've used prayer as an excuse for laziness. I think of some of my family members that some of them have pretty opposing views to me even being a pastor and pretty hostile views. And I have prayed this prayer and said, God, I don't know about reaching out, I don't know about this because their heart's just not right and you, you have control over that and I gotta trust in you for it so I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna give you all of the control. Now to me, that puffs me up as like, man, I'm full of faith because I'm giving God all control but realistically, I'm scared to reach out and do my part and so therefore I'm lazy. And so Joshua, this wasn't a prayer for him. We see that he had, he did what, what he could control, he controlled. He put bet, his best foot forward, he didn't complain, and, and, and he gave us this, this, this model for prayer, that asking and acting, they go hand in hand. I heard this quote, I love it, that, that it says, pray like it depends on God and work like it depends on me. I have a part to play and God has called me to obedience in a part to play that I can control. It's my response to things, it's how I fight, it's how I figure out the source. I have a part to play. But I also can never neglect the power of the Holy Spirit and the power and the victory that only Jesus gives me, not me. Do you see the relationship there? And they go hand in hand for complete victory. Complete victory in your life, in my life. Worship team, you could come up this morning, starting in verse 13. In this event, not recorded, or in this event, not recorded in the book of Jashar, the sun stayed in the middle of the sky and did not set as on a normal day. There's never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. Surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. Then, Israel, or then Joshua and the Israelite army returned to their camp at Gilgal. 
I was praying when I was reading this, and this just, that prayer just struck such a chord in me, not because of the amount of faith it took, but I was wondering, God, why would you answer such a prayer? Why would you answer such a prayer to, to keep the day longer, to keep the planet from moving? To, to, it's, it's mighty, it's huge, why? And I believe that the Holy Spirit revealed to me something that can be so powerful for us this morning is that the sun stand still prayer was to keep the sunlight and keep the sun in the sky so they would have to fight longer, not shorter. He said, make it stick there so we can finish this fight because we need to continue to complete victory. And a lot of times our prayers in our life are possibly to end something when God's calling us to finish something. And this prayer of Joshua's wasn't to end his fight, but it was to finish the fight. And there's a difference because when you pray, God, get this, get, get me out of this situation to end it, it's a very different prayer than God, get me through this. Through implies completed. Out is incomplete. And Joshua knew the promise that he was called the complete victory, not one, not one. And many times in my own life, in our lives, we use prayer and we, use, we pray prayers that would help us to escape situations. It's a prayer of escape. God, just get me out of this, get me out of the pain. But God is calling us this morning not to pray a prayer of escape, but a prayer of completion, of finishing, of complete victory. And it's so, it's not an accident that my mama's here this morning and we were just talking and when I was 12 years old, she um, got, a, uh, got diagnosed with cancer and years before that, a handful of years before that, my grandma, who, my Grammy, who we loved dearly, died from cancer. So as a young kid and I have younger siblings and, and, and an older sister who's here with my lovely cousin, um, we hear the C word and we freak out because we associate it, well, my grandma just died from it and now my mom's going through that. And we prayed these prayers of God, get us out of this pain, get us out of this fear. It was these prayers of escape, which they're, they're not bad prayers. I'm not saying don't pray those prayers, but let me shift your focus this morning on what God wants you to pray. And. Uh, God didn't want to just remove us from pain in that situation, but he wanted to grow us and give us complete victory. And my mom shared with me that the day of or the day before the diagnosis to come back, the results, which the church didn't know about, not many people at all knew that she was even getting tested. And the day before the day of, uh, one of the pastor's wives pulled her aside and said, hey, I had a very, very clear vision of you at the altar and you were completely healed. That was before there was even knowledge of what was about to go down. And so I believe that God was faithful in giving my family and my mom the promise that not one of those cancer cells will overtake you. I've called you to complete victory and I have it for you. And we as a family could stand on that promise even though it was hard, even though it was painful, it was confusing. I got mad at God, God, why would you put my mom through so much pain of six to eight months of chemo? That was horrible. But we could stand on the promise and say, God, let's shift our focus from praying, get me out of this to God, let's get through this because you wanna do complete victory. And we can stand here today going, my mom has been 14, 13 years free of cancer because God is victorious. And we can stand on that. And God doesn't promise us in this life a a, a pain-free life, but he does promise to bring purpose to our pain and do a work in us as well. And so my challenge to you this morning is to stop praying away the war that God has called you to win, but pray instead of out and escape prayers, let's pray through prayers because he's proclaimed, you will go through the valley, you will go through the fire, You will go through the water because I am with you and you have victory in my name. 
why does God do this? Because God doesn't want to change your fight. He wants to change your faith. And he'll change your fight. I'm not saying don't ever pray against cancer. Or don't pray for financial, relational healing. Don't pray for be set free from addiction. That's not what I'm saying this morning. But I'm saying, would you change your prayer to, instead of get me out of this, God, have your way in this. I want you to have victory for me and victory in me. Because Joshua needed a lesson that God has not just victory for him because he knew that from Jericho and he knew that from other nations, but he needed victory in him to go, Joshua, it's all about me. I have the victory. I am the victor and therefore you are. So Joshua needed victory in his own heart. And he aligned this prayer, the sun stands still as, God, it's okay if the fight lasts longer, but let me fight hard because you're gonna have victory. Use this to complete victory in me. Pray for God to finish the fight in your life, not to end it. To finish cancer, to finish problems, to finish depression, to finish addiction, wherever you're at this morning. And I know you can have this because God sent his son from heaven to earth and he got up on a cross for you and it says he's the author and finisher of our faith. And he got on the cross and he uttered these three powerful words at the end and he said, it is finished. It's finished. It's finished. There's victory. He won the victory for us, but also to be in us. Let him grow your faith this morning. Let him have complete victory in you. Would you stand with me this morning? A lot of times we think when a fight happens in our life that it must not be God. That opposition, an obstacle, God must not be in that because I shouldn't be fighting. If really if God is for me and who is against me, I shouldn't be fighting anything. But faith, I mean a fight isn't the evidence of God's faithlessness, but it is the opportunity for his faithfulness. See the heaviest of fighting that the Israelites had to endure was in the promised land was in the land that God said, that's yours. Joshua, wherever you land your foot, I'll be there and you have victory. That was the heaviest of fighting. And a fight in our life doesn't mean God's not in it. And God can turn this, these obstacles and let him turn them to obstacle to opportunity. Because without this fight, this miracle wouldn't have even happened. And I, I would argue that it would take longer Joshua to have this miracle of victory in him to happen as well. God can turn our mistakes, our messes into miracles and obstacles and opportunities. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I don't know where you're at. I don't know what fight you're in. You may be in here going, I, my life is pretty good. But maybe you've made peace with some things that you're supposed to conquer. You may be in a fight this morning in a struggle and there's victory for you in the name of Jesus. And that victory may look different. I, I, I don't know, sometimes God doesn't heal cancer. And that's okay because we can have victory still. God is still good. There's still purpose in it. And so this morning, if you would say in this place and confidently raise a hand to heaven and say, God, I wanna have victory in a situation. I wanna turn to you. I wanna respond properly. No longer will I be a victim. And I walk as a victor now. Would you just raise a hand to heaven if that's you? It's between you and God. That's an identity change this morning. Yes, hands up all over the place. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna dive into a time of just quick worship and I pray that you would, if you need to come down front and just get before Jesus because you caused a problem or, or maybe you need to rebuke the devil and step on praise on his head or maybe you just need to say, God, I need more trust, I need more faith because you're allowing me to go through something. Let's do that through worship this morning. God, we just thank you, Jesus, that you have victory in your name. You give it, you gave it to us. You have it for us. I pray that we would walk in it, that no longer would we be victims, but would we be victors in your name. God, do a mighty work in our hearts as you give us victory in our faith, as you finish our faith, God. I pray that you change our prayer lives, you change our perspectives and focuses on being able to trust you more as we worship you, Jesus. We sing this in your name. Amen.